Welcome everyone. Welcome to this um, Books at GMF discussion on the future of European defense. I am uh, Alexandra de Hoop-Sheffer joining you from uh, rainy Paris. I'm the Director of Research for Transatlantic Security and the Director of the Paris Office of the German Marshall Fund. And uh, I'm extremely happy to host this discussion uh, with the three authors of the book Future of War and the Defense of Europe, which was recently published by the Oxford University Press. So I will introduce our three speakers and invite them to turn their camera on. Um, John General uh, John Allen, uh, president of the Brookings Institution. He was uh, previously commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and US forces in Afghanistan. Very happy to, to see you. Uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, uh, he currently holds the Pershing Chair of, in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and he was previously commander of the United States Army in Europe, and uh, Professor Dr. Julian Lindley French, a senior fellow at the Institute of Statecraft and founder and chair of the Alphen Group. So a very warm welcome uh, to the three of you and a very warm welcome to everyone who is attending uh, this event uh, for on both sides of the uh, Atlantic. Before getting into the substance um, of, the, um, of the book and the conversation, uh, just let me remind all of you that you can purchase uh, this really fascinating uh, book um, from Oxford University Press by using the code that was actually uh, included in the invitation and that my colleagues uh, will insert in the chat box so you can use that. And by using this code, you will benefit uh, from a 30% uh, discount. So do not uh, hesitate. Um, in this book, John Allen, Ben Hodges, and Julian Lindy French um, offer a truly interesting forward-looking view uh, of European defense by looking at different scenarios uh, with a 10-year time horizon um, and discussing the role of a fast-changing transatlantic relationship at a time when, uh, as they wrote in their book, US is the United States is increasingly overstretched and Europeans continue to be understretched. Um, and so this book really explores the implications of this, uh, of this scenario. Um, it also makes some really interesting concrete recommendations on the tech dimension of the future of war. So I really invite you to read uh, these chapters who are truly interesting and innovative uh, in terms of uh, public-private uh, partnership recommendations. The overall question raised uh, by the three offers um, in this book is really how can Europe bolster its defense and prepare for the future of warfare? Um, I will invite everyone in terms of the comments and questions to very simply use the chat box very freely and very informally as we are discussing um, uh, throughout the conversation and then I'll do my best to regroup some of the questions and address them to uh, our speakers. Um, I will first leave the floor to uh, Julian. Uh, to introduce uh, the topic uh, of the book um, and then have uh, Ben and, and John uh, also making short uh, introductive uh, uh, opening remarks and then we'll move with the conversation. So Julian, if you want to begin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra. And let me express the gratitude from all three of us to you and, and the German Marshall Fund for hosting this wonderful event. We, we, we really do appreciate it. You'll see behind me uh, uh, the cover of the book, which is based, as you see, on a photograph of me, um, and uh, uh, very high tech, uh, the, which is, uh, I think, says everything. But it's not 
the future I want to start with. It's the past, because it's a story which I think captures the very essence of what this book is about. 80 years ago this week, on Monday, on May 24th, um, HMS Hood, uh, an aging British battle cruiser, 47,000 tons, uh, went into battle with the German fast battleship uh, Bismarck. Nine minutes into the action, a uh, 15-inch shell from the Bismarck plunged into the aft main magazine of, of the Hood, and she blew up. And she took down with her 1,415 men of her 1,418 crew. And the question was, why was she there? Why was an old ship facing a brand new technology? And the answer was because between the wars, uh, British defence policy had not been properly aligned between strategy, capability, capacity, commitments, reality and threat. Uh, too often funds had been cut, too often funds had been diverted. And on too few occasion, key elements were simply not funded. Uh, add that to the fact that the British were increasingly overstretched the world over, the British Armed Forces, particularly the Royal Navy. In May 1941, Churchill had no option but to send the hood up against the Bismarck, because had the Bismarck broken out into the Atlantic, she could have wreaked havoc with the Atlantic convoys coming from the US and Canada to Britain, war-sustaining convoys, uh, at a crucial moment. Now, thankfully, uh, the Hood and the ship that was with her, Prince of Wales, did enough damage to the Bismarck to destroy uh, the Nazi operation. Uh, but it was a mark of that imbalance between the wars that led to those men dying so tragically in that action. And in a sense, the book is about that, Europe today, where uh, strategy, policy, capability, capacity, commitments, uh, funding, but above all technology are not aligned with the threats and the realities that we must all face, North Americans and Europeans alike, if the security and defence of Europe is to be guaranteed into the future. All the assumptions to which we've become accustomed since 1949 under America's protection are now being challenged. And it is that, a wake-up call, if you like, that the book offers both to leaders and led alike. Alexandra? Thank you. Ben? So, Alexandra, thank you. Uh, and, and really so good to see you again. Uh, GMF does such a terrific job all over Europe as well as in, in D.C., and so we're grateful for this. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Prague. I'm, I'm here in the Czech Republic for a couple of days. Uh, nice to be able to meet people in person and, and to talk with people from foreign ministry and defense ministry and think tanks and uh, journalists here, as well as our excellent U.S. diplomats working here in Prague. And I was reminded by several things in the last two days of why, why I was so proud to be a part of this book effort and, and why the principal target for the book are political decision makers um, that have to make the, the decisions and priorities to ensure the alignment and, and not allow the misalignment that Julian just described with such a, a tragic historical vignette. Um, of course, you know, here in, in Prague uh, on Monday, 60 Russian diplomats will be at the airport getting on the plane going home. Uh, this is the rest of the, uh, uh, the, the Russian diplomats from the embassy here, which by the way, has almost 140 Russian diplomats at their embassy in Prague, which is twice the size of the American embassy here, by the way. But because of the incident at the uh, Verbatice uh, ammunition point that killed two Czech citizens seven years ago, but which has come to light now, the Czech government had the courage to expel uh, almost 80 Russian diplomats, and most of them, the rest of them are going home on Monday. I, I was surprised. Uh, a strong statement by the Czech government, but they are under significant pressure, and there is a, a growing, uh, not just realization, but they're remembering who the threat is, that, that Russia represents a real threat. And so, uh, but they also were looking to the United States for leadership. 
So this is kind of the conundrum that our book attempts to uh, address. European nations, our allies, taking responsibility for their part of the defense, the collective defense of Europe, but the United States can't walk away from it. And in fact, if the United States stays involved um, with, from a leadership standpoint uh, and commitment, then I think it makes it easier and more likely that our allies will actually follow through on the things that they need to do. For the Czech Republic, they've made a commitment to field a armored brigade, a modernized armored brigade by 2026. I would say at this point, it's not likely they're gonna make it. 210 armored vehicles, part of this, because people are questioning, wait a minute, if future war is all about cyber and disinformation and drones and unmanned systems, why do you need armored vehicles? And of course, I would explain to them, what were we all scared of, or not scared of, but worried about in Ukraine six weeks ago? It was endless video of Russian tanks, artillery, armored vehicles, paratroopers, and the Black Sea Fleet. Very, very conventional tactics. So hybrid war and future war does not exclude steel uh, and conventional forces. That's a part of it. And so that's why our allies have got to continue to produce uh, those kinds of capabilities. Thank you very much, Ben. And John? Well, let me uh, echo the comments of my two dear friends uh, in thanking you, Alexandra, uh, and thanking GMF. Uh, and as Ben said, uh, and thank you for all that you do, uh, both uh, before the scenes and behind the scenes uh, for the, the great transatlantic relationship that we enjoy. We never take it for granted, I hope. Um, but also, let me tell you, I think I can speak for all three colleagues that we would love to be have, have convened with you in Paris today also. Um, so lucky you. Uh, let me uh, take just a couple minutes uh, beforehand um, and, and, and echo again uh, what Julian and Ben said. Uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll say that I, not a day goes by that I don't think about the magnificent troops of the NATO Secu International Security Assistance Force, which I had the opportunity to command in Afghanistan, 50 nations, NATO plus partners. Uh, they were great and brave soldiers, and I mourn the loss every day of the ones that we sent home to their families. But it was a great performance, and I am an absolute believer in NATO, and I will tell you that uh, in the book, we offer our views with all humility. Uh, recognizing we don't have all the answers, but we've got some pretty important questions and some concerns, and we sought to structure the book around uh, those realities that we face today, and Ben and Julian have, have touched on those. I have some personal experience as well. My grandfather uh, in World War I was one of the very first American army units that was gassed uh, on the Western Front, and he was permanently disabled for the rest of his life and died very young. Uh, my father, in a brand new high technology American destroyer, involved before we were bombed at Pearl Harbor, before the United States entered the war, was engaged in the secret convoying of British convoys from North America at a time when we were not sure how this was going to turn out for the UK and certainly for the rest of the free world as the Nazis tightened their grip on Europe. Uh, and if anyone here has seen the movie Greyhound, that was his war, except that he was actually torpedoed by a German U-boat, nearly lost it. And then in my own experience in combat, uh, I've had the opportunity to apply some pretty sophisticated digital technologies in the cyber environment. Now I raise that because we had three virtually revolutionary technologies in three wars in, for three generations, gas, submarine technology, and ultimately some of the digital technologies uh, that we're seeing today. And the question for me really isn't uh, whether those technologies can be brought to bear in a small or a narrow sense in the battle space. The question is, are we thinking broadly enough about the relationship between the character of war, which is the technology, and the nature of war, which is the human dimension? Are we thinking about uh, the realities that technology isn't just changing, but the rate of change of technology is enormous now? And are we keeping up uh, in the context of our, our leadership, our capacity to create public-private partnerships with the private sector? Are we understanding the rate of change? Are we uh, employing the doctrine 
which ultimately can permit us with these technological changes, sometimes relatively small technological changes, having enormous impact? Are we employing the human dimension in proper equilibrium with the technical dimension, the character of war, to achieve the most that we can get out of this? So what we see today, of course, is that, uh, as Ben very properly said, uh, we're going to still need armored vehicles. We're going to still need grunt infantrymen. Uh, but what changes for us now uh, is that so much more of what will determine conflict will occur in a multi-domain environment, and in particular, the cyber environment, which will play heavily in what's being called today hybrid war, uh, which occurs in the cyber dimension, uh, in the context of either cyber espionage or cyber criminality or cyber terror or cyber warfare. But then as technology continues, as we continue to see uh, a move through computing power, algorithmic cap capacity and autonomy, we'll see that the speed of conflict is going to start to accelerate. And it's gonna accelerate in ways that may blur the distinction between the character of war in the Clausewitzian sense and the nature of war and where the human fits in the, the uh, equation of future combat. So these are big questions and they raise questions about how does this technological change fit into what we must have in NATO, which is a comprehensive integrated deterrence from the highest level of our nuclear command and control right down to the lowest level of our tactical application and in all domains. This is a humble offering because we know that NATO is thinking about these kinds of things, but we wanna help the process of the considerations. And so that was the purpose in writing the book. Uh, it was a process in helping to raise the right questions, which we think in some respects we've answered. And I'll just uh, go silent now and let's go to the questions and answers. And again, thank you so much for doing this for us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, Ben, and, uh, and Julian. Um, a first um, common question that your, your book, um, uh, triggered with really about what, in fact, the NATO 2030 report has been uh, mentioning as well, which is that we are in an era of uh, strategic simult simultaneity, right? And I think that your book really underscores that in a very concrete way um, and brings together everything you three have been just uh, mentioning, which is a simultaneity of crisis but also a hybridity of the different characters and natures of war. And you mentioned uh, the 5D warfare, disinformation, deception, destabilization, disruption, and potentially destruction. And so my question uh, maybe to you, uh, uh, Julian, is um, you know, you, you've been thinking in the book about these scenarios looking at 2030. Uh, would, could, could we say that you know, we are already facing uh, this very complex simultaneity of crisis when you look at the recent combination of the Russian military buildup in Ukraine, uh, China's growing firepower and increasing tensions around the Taiwanese uh, Strait, uh, while we are still dealing with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Are we not already in this scenario where you have this hybridity and simultaneity of crisis? What do you think we have learned and not learned uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, your book also encouraged us, encourage experts, policymakers, uh, to change our lenses, if I can say, and to change the way we view security, defense, as John Allen said, human security, this intermix between security and, and defense, between economics, social implications, strategic political implications, do you think we have already learned or we have not fully learned yet the lessons of this complex period within which we, we are? So I know there are several questions, but Julian, I was eager to, to, to hear from you on that initial comment. Thanks, Alexandra. No pressure there then. Um, look, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book with two such distinguished American colleagues was that I've been in this game many, many times. I wrote my PhD on it many years ago. I've written books, I've written articles. And I'm frankly tired of saying to my fellow Europeans, we've really got to make European defense work as Europeans within the context of the transatlantic relationship. Now, you know, 20 plus years ago, I was a lead author on, on the Venusberg Group reports for the Bertelsmann Foundation. 
we were driving at this back then but we've talked too much but now we can't talk we've got to really act and your point about simultaneity and hybridity is very well taken war historically doesn't just happen because a madman designs it it happens because of a range of factors come together technology uh, connectivity opportunity and one of the things that is becomes becoming increasingly apparent with the rise of china for example is that united states cannot be strong everywhere all of the time and the very real danger does exist that an engineered crisis could happen in the next within the next decade where the US is forced to look in several directions at once and across several domains, to engage in the Indo-Pacific, facing crises in the Middle East and indeed in Europe at the same time. Now, in those circumstances, Europeans will have to become far more effective as first responders to help keep America strong and where she needs to be strong so that Europe can be secure. But there seems to be almost denial in many European capitals that this is required, that somehow we can go on with the same kind of 1990s, early noughties narrative uh, about European defence, as though it's more academic uh, than, than actual. Well, it's not. We are now at a crunch point. The NATO Reflection Group report also agrees with us on, on, on that very point. And we now have to take action. Um, so the book is indeed a call to arms. In fact, we've thought about uh, calling the book uh, uh, The Future of Peace uh, in, in Europe rather than Defense of Europe, because it is about the future of peace in Europe. Now, one word on COVID-19. Well, there's a danger with some political leaders in some countries that they'll embark on the strategic equivalent of ambulance chasing, that they will, under pressure from concerned publics, place health security for understandable reasons above defense and often raid defense budgets to help realize enhanced health security because let's face it many of them got the pandemic wrong and publics are scared and it's in the immediate political mind of those who lead us and what we're saying in the book is yes we have to deal with what happened with the pandemic but we also have to deal with the reality of maintaining credible deterrence and defense in the face of these emerging threats, which are very real, and maintaining an engagement with potential chaos to Europe South with huge implications for Europe, we have to find a balance which is credible, which will realize such ends. And one final thought on this. The problem as ever is money. Before the pandemic, the Eurozone uh, uh, debt to GDP ratios was around about 83%. Now it's at, on an average of 98%, with Italy having a debt to GDP ratio of 155%. The, the deficit to GDP ratio, which as you know should be no more than 3%, uh, according to EU rules, is now on average 7.2%. So some very tough choices are going to have to be made by European leaders together if Europeans defense, Europe's defense is to be maintained into the future as a credible defense, and whether those tough choices are made will be the test, not just of Europe's defense, but also the future transatlantic relationship and the sharing of burdens, which is implicit uh, in, in the challenge. Alexandra? Thank you, Julian. And we have a, a question directly linked to what you, you just said uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Kurt uh, Geisert in, in Brussels. When I listen to you, is the 2% goal enough? <laughs> uh, ben, do you want to take that? Yeah, 2% actually, in terms of quantity, is enough. But it's nowhere near enough in terms of what actual contributions should look like. I understand why we have 2%. I mean, it makes it easy in some ways for marketing and it's, a, it's an obvious metric. The problem is we have members of the Alliance who are 2 percenters that spend almost all their money on personnel costs um, or outrageous pension plans or buy weapons that are oriented on another member of the Alliance. Um, whereas we've got others who are less than 2% but provide 
extremely important critical capabilities for the alliance. So uh, I'm not against 2%, uh, but I think we could be much more sophisticated about what 2% means. Uh, I'm not in favor of the idea of combining, you know, uh, humanitarian aid and foreign aid with defense spending because that would completely dissipate and, and miss the whole point. Uh, it's got to be focused on capabilities. But if you think about Germany, for example, um, looking at their domestic political situation, coalition government, uh, in a million years, they're never going to hit 2% as long as SPD has the finance minister position, for example. Um, so what do we need from our German allies? We need a high level of readiness where they are now is unacceptable. Um, but they need to be providing air and missile defense for the Baltic region. Uh, they need to be providing uh, tr transportation to be the logistics hub for the alliance. They're no longer on the inner German border on the front line. That's, they are the, the hub for power projection. So why not encourage them to invest in improving transportation infrastructure that is thoroughly protected from cyber attacks because the alliance will need that as part of our deterrence. And so I think we could be a little bit more clever about um, where, how we give credit towards this 2% um, when nations provide, uh, I mean, Dutch ports, Belgian ports, French ports, as well as German ports are essential for the Alliance. That ought to count towards um, 2%. Thank you, Ben. If I could stay with you and after I'll turn to, uh, to John. Um, your book focuses a lot at the beginning on, you know, the threat analysis. Um, if we don't get the threat analysis right, then you cannot actually uh, have to configure your tools and the instruments and the response accordingly. And, and so my question to you is, do you think uh, Americans and Europeans see the future of war in the same way? How do their vision, vision diverge? I remember in 2016, I was hosting uh, in, in Paris um, a, a workshop on the third offset strategy uh, with Bob Work's team. We had a few French, German, British, uh, senior policymakers, and the whole discussion showed, you know, what you said at the beginning, this sort of misalignment between uh, the, the Americans on the one hand and Europeans on the other hand, in terms of thinking uh, of future threats that we would be facing in five or 10 years to come. Americans with thinking of the potential first kinetic confrontation with China. At that time, they were speaking of a 10 year uh, time horizon. The French were, obsessed with obviously the terrorist attacks. The British, uh, you know, just voted Brexit. They were focused on their uh, domestic business and the Germans were, were pretty much less, you know, absent from the whole strategic conversation. So do, do you see any progress um, in this transatlantic conversation on the uh, analysis of the threat um, and of the future uh, of, of war, which is the topic uh, of, your, of your book? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, that, that is probably the biggest challenge that we have is the lack of will for many political leaders in many countries to acknowledge the threat. We continue to be surprised by what the Kremlin does because we try to look at, we, we assume that they're going to look at things the way we in the West would look at it. And then they're like, oh my God, I can't believe he invaded Ukraine. Or, oh my God, I can't believe that they would um, or I hear people, really smart, super educated, professional people say, come on, there's no way they're going to use force in, in here. Or people will say, Ukraine is not even a real country. I mean, so that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're dealing with. And of course, the Kremlin knows that because they see that we have done zip since they invaded Georgia. And by the way, today, happy Independence Day to all my Georgian friends. 20% uh, of Georgia, however, is not independent. It is occupied by Russian forces. But they saw we didn't do anything after 2008, they saw we didn't do anything after the Assad regime, which is propped only still having their fake election today because the Russian, the Kremlin has kept them in power. Uh, and they, when they stepped over President Obama's red line, they saw we didn't do anything. And then they invaded Ukraine in 2014 and they saw we didn't do anything. EU sanctions may have slowed down Russian military modernization. That's it. They have felt no punishment. And so uh, we continue to be surprised. And then even the re reaction yesterday of the European Union, the fastest I have ever seen the Union move in response to uh, the, the uh, hijacking of this Ryan airplane in Belarus, 
I was proud to see how fast the EU responded and forcefully, but 100% of their condemnation was of Lukashenko, zero on the Kremlin. But yet there was no way this could have happened without the Kremlin being involved because Belarus, the air defense systems of Belarus and Russia are 100% integrated. So there's no way a, a Belarusian airplane goes up and forces this plane down without the Kremlin's approval. So it's just really frustrating reluctance to be direct. And now I'm afraid my own president is also, looks like they might be starting to head down the, and, and falling into the same trap that we can somehow uh, persuade the Kremlin and then we can all get along. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ben. Um, I will continue with the big picture and then zoom in on a few questions on European uh, strategic autonomy because that's also a part of your of your book and, and argument. But Alan, uh, John, I wanted to to turn to you uh, on China because we have a few questions on China and more specifically on the Russian Chinese. Uh, access and uh, alliance. So one question is, do you see um, a, uh, an alignment, an increasing alignment between the American and European analysis of the threats posed by China and more specifically in the military domain? And there are a few uh, questions on the Russian-Chinese alliance. Uh, do you think that we are underestimating this alliance by portraying it as an alliance of circumstances whereas this alliance seems to have deeper strategic political uh, ground. Uh, and what should be the Western response to such a potential emerging axis, axis if this is a concern uh, to you? Uh, as Julian said, multiple questions. I feel like I'm testifying before Congress. Um, <clears throat> and they're all really good questions. The first is, uh, as uh, Ben said, uh, the United States certainly as a part of NATO, but the United States in the context of the Euro-Atlantic, transatlantic relationship uh, with our European partners, uh, we will never see the threat exactly the same, but I think we'll see the threat in large measure in, uh, in, in the same way. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons for that, I think, is, is very, very important. And, and it's, it's, a, it's at the heart of what we talk about in the book. It's, it's at the heart of what we say in public. And that is in the context of the transatlantic relationship, we share one thing uh, that gives us the capacity to do incredible uh, activity and, and things in the world. And that's what our shared values. And those shared values are what is at the heart of the idea of NATO. Uh, those shared values exist at the heart of what's known as the European Union. Th those shared values are at the heart of uh, our North Atlantic uh, excuse me, our North American and uh, Euro in the Euro-Atlantic context, they're all there, it's there. So in many respects, because we have those shared values, we can see the threats uh, pretty clearly. And I think we will find ourselves in, in large uh, uh, agreement on what those threats are. Now, we may not have uh, the same kind of alignment with respect to uh, uh, economic relationships or in diplomatic relationships and capitals may go their own way with respect to individual relations or dialogue or conversations with the Russians or the Chinese. And we can expect that. But I do believe that the basis of values, which defines who we are as a people, uh, a commitment to human rights, the rights of women, the rule of law, all of those things have given us a strength to accomplish incredible things in the period of time during World War II and since. That's going to be what helps us to see these threats as we go forward. And we may not align perfectly on them, but I think we align pretty clearly. Um, with regard to the Chinese and Russian, uh, let me come back, you asked a question about, do we see the Chinese military threat the same? And I think we do. Uh, I think there's a very strong alignment within the militaries of Europe and North uh, America and how we view uh, Chinese progress going forward. And I've spent a lot of time looking at this and a lot of time looking at how the Chinese are investing in advanced technologies, emerging technologies, um, and incorporating them into the military to include uh, fully autonomous weapon systems. And that's, a, that's an area where a community of ours, uh, the transatlantic relationship, we're still very concerned. 
uh, about the human role, the human supervision of autonomous systems. And I will tell you that the Russians and the Chinese are not constrained by the same values that we have. So I think we do see the Chinese military threat in, in very similar ways, although we may not see them precisely the same politically, diplomatically, or economically. But I think the Chinese in many respects are so clarifying their activities and their behaviors that those alignments are actually moving into congruence. I think that's important. Um, when you look at the history of the Russian-Chinese relationships, uh, while I, I, I'm very attentive to it, uh, I, I, uh, I don't fear it, frankly. Uh, and we should all be attentive uh, to the, what the Russians and the Chinese are doing to perhaps improve each other's readiness, which is something that's relatively easy, short of con conflict. But one of the things I think that we should all uh, be very attentive to is how the Chinese react ultimately to Russian aggression. Uh, and while they um, were uh, very vocal on the Russian activities in 14 in the Ukraine and said, uh, in the uh, one of the Chinese propaganda pa newspapers, it said that once again, the Russians have proven that power eventually does exist from the muzzle of a weapon. Uh, we should be attentive to those kinds of things. I, I do believe that the Chinese would be very constraining of a relationship with Russia if they felt that the Russians were attempting to uh, make a kinetic move uh, uh, more dramatically in Europe. It's not in China's interest to ultimately find itself in a war with the United States and East Asia uh, or a war with a coalition uh, where the Chinese rely so deeply on economic relations, rely so deeply on the un unimpeded flow of energy to fuel its economy. And remember, China hasn't been in a war in a very long time. Uh, the last uh, major conflict they had was with the Vietnamese in uh, the late 70s. That didn't go well for them, frankly. So I think they're very attentive to those hotspots. And I've served in Europe, four tours, served in the Middle East in combat, and I've served in East Asia for extended uh, presence missions. Uh, and in particular owned the Taiwan portfolio uh, for the Defense Department. So I think the Chinese uh, will seek to create a relationship with the United States, which, which by the way is shifting to Julian's point, more and more of our military power in the East Asia. Uh, it'll be very attentive to that. The quad that is emerging, which is the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, is very concerning to the Chinese because they view it as a containment mechanism. We don't, but we see it as a, a, a means of alignment which can compete with China. And ultimately, the whole issue of, of what happens in NATO if the United States finds itself one morning waking up and some of our sophisticated uh, naval units have been attacked in the South China Sea. And now America has been attacked. What does NATO do? So this is a big issue for the Chinese and they do not wanna back into, because the Russians did it, or stumble into a kinetic war with the United States. And we have these threats and Ben laid them out pretty well. We have the China threat. China is now a European factor and we should be attentive to that and understand it. We have the Russian uh, challenge that we have and Europeans who may not be particularly concerned about Russia and they ought to be, but they may not be particularly concerned about Russia, are very deeply concerned about instability to the South. Remember what 2 million Syrian refugees did to European politics in 2015. And then very importantly, something that we don't consider a threat, but certainly is I think a strategic vulnerability, is what happens with the widening technological gap between the United States and NATO, the United States and our allies. And then finally, we need to think more I think broadly than what we would call the transatlantic relationship. If we're gonna compete with China, we have to think about the community of democracies. And there are very vibrant democracies in East Asia with hugely capable uh, so, uh, technologically sophisticated economies and technology bases who are just as committed to human rights, just as committed to the rule of law, just as committed to democracy as we are as in the so-called West which is increasingly becoming an exclusionary term. So these are all points that we try to get to, understanding the threat being based on values and understanding that technology will play a decisive role as we go forward in multiple domains. 
Thank you, John. And I have um, a sort of two finger question for you uh, from uh, Willem uh, Dassorst, um, who says, are NATO's, are NATO's shared values perhaps being undermined by developments in Turkey, Hungary, relations with Russia and China, Poland, rule of law in particular? What about President Macron's statement that NATO is brain dead? Can the Biden administration play a role in arresting these trends in particular when it comes to Poland and Hungary, perhaps? Well, we should all be worried about Hungary. Uh, it has drifted into, I think, a, a level of illiberalism that uh, we should all be attentive to. Uh, we should all be very concerned about uh, the Turkish relationship with Russia and the sale of the S-400 system. Um, we should all be very concerned about uh, the role of China in the context of the 17 plus one uh, and the bilateral relationships, which in fact work both to the disadvantage of the United States, but also to the coherence and the cohesion of the EU over time. Um, and you know the comment about being brain dead. <clears throat> um, well, I'd ask him to how he feels about it now. He may have felt that strongly about it because it's now a little while ago that he said that, unless he's reiterated it recently. Uh, it could well be that he was implying that uh, as a direct result of the uh, of the I would call it ignorant ambivalence of the US leadership at that particular time, which was not apparently committed to NATO, didn't understand the, the NATO alliance. I'm talking about the president, Jim Mattis did, but uh, that it's difficult to break through that ceiling sometimes. Uh, and I think that uh, the great work that's been done by the secretary general, I think that the, the reinvigoration that has occurred in several different ways uh, with regard to NATO uh, ought to give uh, President Macron, who is a very consequential and important leader in Europe, uh, and his voice really carries a lot of weight, might give him an opportunity to speak uh, differently about brain, uh, the, the brain deadedness of, of uh, NATO. We might be seeing some electrons move in these days, and a lot of them, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, John. I see a two finger by, by Ben. Yes. Yeah, if I could just add two quick points. First, uh, in the, uh, we are absolutely not brain dead. The, the Alliance is the most successful alliance in the history of the world. And despite all the challenges, all the problems and, and justified criticisms, there are nations lining up still wanting to join NATO. And there's a reason for that. There's nobody knocking on the door of the Kremlin saying, hey, please let me back in. We want to get the band back together. So that's the first point. The second point to um, uh, Willem's uh, questions about uh, concern over Hungary and Poland and Turkey, the United States, we have got to get our house in order. I mean, and I think the president, President Biden, is is making this case that we have got to fix ourselves um, if we expect to be um, to meet the high expectations of all our friends and allies. We have got to get ourselves fixed, uh, restore confidence in in all of our own processes, uh, and and I think we will be in a better place to uh, help encourage or prevent backsliding by our allies. Thank you, Ben. Um, then I will turn back to you, uh, Julian, because I have a few questions on European strategic autonomy. Uh, so, uh, you know, a question that um, your book uh, addresses. In fact, your book challenges Europeans to imagine the defense of Europe without uh, the Americans. And the book also says Americans must not only accept such an ambition, but also encourage it. And so I have several questions, one from uh, Nell Pullman. How does the role of European strategic autonomy play into the future of defense? And then a question more focused on uh, the UK. Uh, your discussion from Graham Jones, your discussion shows how important European defense cooperation is. How best can we detoxify for British voters their deep-seated fear of the emergence of a European army? So. Thank you. Uh, two uh, great questions. Uh, let me just briefly say, as a follow on to John and Ben, look, as a Western European, the problem is not Central Europe. Uh, the problem is that Western Europeans in particular are not serious enough about these issues. There is a crisis of deterrence in Europe, but not for Western Europeans. No one's going to attack Western Europeans. But unless Western Europeans, Britain, France, and Germany to the fore, together, lead the future of Europe's European defense, whatever format it takes, then given American overstretch, there could be a profound problem for other Europeans. And that's our duty as Western Europeans to all Europeans that we get our 
Western European act together, which kind of, you know, follows on to, to, to the question about strategic autonomy. Look, this is, a, for me, indicative of Europe's essential malaise that I've been part of for so many years, sadly. We're very good at making words, but autonomy is a function of power. It's not a function of words. Europe will be autonomous, i.e. have the capacity and ability to act autonomously from the United States in a high-end emergency. This is the real test. When Europe develops sufficient capabilities and capacities to be able to do so. If it doesn't, then it won't be autonomous, period. That's it. Uh, so I support the idea of European strategic autonomy because it will be essential through NATO, our future spear tip, of keeping America strong where she needs to be strong and enabling the Americans to maintain their security guarantee to Europe, which can only take place if Europeans do far for, more for their own defence, both in Europe and around Europe, in partnership with the United States and other democracies. Now, that's not going, only going to take an investment uh, hike, and it will. It's going to require a mindset change, a mindset change on the part, particularly, again, Western Europeans, but most notably Germany. Uh, I had a question uh, linked to uh, my own country about European army. Look, I'm an Oxford historian. A European army is a very long way off. Why? Because you need a European government to have a European army. And most Brits have no real sense that that's going to happen very soon. And I think most continental Europeans don't either. But what we do need at the core of Europe's future defence is a credible army of Europeans of which the United Kingdom, Europe's most advanced military actor, sorry, France, it is, and it's going to become more advanced given current developments and current investments by the British, by the way, um, of which Britain must be a part. And at the core of that will be a future European force that can act as a first responder in a crisis at the highest end of, of, of threat across air, sea, land, cyber, space, information and knowledge. And that can only come by Europeans working very closely together. And bluntly, we've got to put Brexit to one side. It's a sideshow. It's a strategic sideshow. London's got to recognise that it's a European power. And France, in particular, has got to understand that it cannot have a close strategic partnership with London, which frankly is the most important strategic partnership in Europe, if it also continues to try and damage Britain over Brexit. The two are linked. So let's get over it. And let's look at the real big picture, which is how Western Europeans, who have the capacity, the capability, the technology, and indeed the funding, to drive forward this future European effort as part of the wider transatlantic uh, relationship, a changing relationship in a changing world, where we can start focusing on what exactly it is we need to deliver to make that a reality. If not, autonomy, just more words. And I've heard so many in my many years in this business. Thank you, Alexandra. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Julian. Um, on the future of US engagement with and in uh, Europe, a couple of, uh, of questions, uh, and it's true that it resonates. I mean, you just you know mentioned uh, the, the French concept of strategic uh, autonomy. It's true that France has been having a sort of a long-term vision of a progressive US disengagement uh, from, from Europe because of the so-called pivot to Asia, uh, the, the China threat seen as the biggest geopolitical challenge of the 21st century, and that therefore this validates uh, to a big extent the Europeans' ambition to be more strategically autonomous. Uh, but then I'll, I'll turn to you, Ben, um, uh, because in, in the book, um, several times, you know, uh, you mentioned that uh, there, there's a shift also taking place in the United States. Uh, I, I quote one of the sentences that I, I took on, in that context, the changing nature of America itself 
will soon weaken the transatlantic bond. Uh, if you could just develop uh, this idea, because I think that this also resonates uh, to a big extent here uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. What, what are the, I mean, and you know, there's a lot of debate. Uh, was Trump's, you know, uh, NATO bashing, uh, transactionism, just, uh, you know, something uh, temporary? Or was he representing a deeper trend uh, in the United States? Um, I remember having conversations with a few Trump advisors saying, you know, Europeans, you shouldn't be fearing uh, US military disengagement from Europe, but maybe more US, US cultural disengagement from Europe as the United States uh, demographic is changing, as the priorities in terms of the foreign policy focus is changing. So are there deeper trends that we should be looking at? Uh, could you develop that part of the, uh, of, of the book? So there is no doubt that there is a certain uh, DNA in Americans that is isolations, that is inward, inward focus. I, I don't think it's as pronounced now as it was, say, 80, 90 years ago. But uh, for average, typical Americans, and I, I think of my sisters, I think of my friends, people that, you know, that are not necessarily in government or in the military. Um, and they do wonder, like, hey, what the heck, you know, why don't why didn't Europe do more? Or why do we have to go do? Now, I don't think that's a well-informed opinion, but nonetheless, it is a widely held opinion. And the fact is, uh, President Trump um, has a, there's a base of support that follows and, and uh, eats up uh, that message that he put out. But I think that uh, this is where leadership matters. And it was so important that the, uh, our new president on day one during his inauguration, he made the point of how important allies are, uh, a recognition that the United States cannot address all of our threats and protect all of our interests by ourselves. And so having strong allies, supporting them and them supporting us is an essential part uh, of our security. But I'd also say from a just a common sense uh, standpoint, uh, the EU is America's largest trading partner. I mean, our own prosperity depends on a prosperous, stable, secure Europe. So even if not one European nation spent one krona, euro, pound, or uh, lira, it doesn't matter that uh, or we still need a stable, secure Europe. Plus, all of our best and most reliable allies come from Europe, as well as Canada and Australia. So I, I don't see us turning our back uh, on Europe or, or walking away from Europe. Uh, but there is a point we can't take for granted that it will always be like it was, say, 20 years ago. Thank you, Ben. Um, I have a few other questions, um, John, on the technological aspects of, um, uh, of your book. Um, one from Chris uh, Burdett, um, you know, saying that an important part of this conversation is really the state of the defense industry in Europe. And he would like to hear your thoughts on the impact uh, of Brexit on Europe's capacity to develop the technologies and invest effectively so as to maximize defense spending and meet the security challenges and threats you describe um, in your book. Uh, and another question related to the tech dimension of the future of war is um, on the sort of lack of innovative thinking um, when it comes to, uh, to the tech issues within the EU framework. Uh, what could be done in order to improve that? Are Europeans underestimating the tech challenge? And could there be more transatlantic cooperation to deal with that specific uh, issue? John. <clears throat> Let me uh, also invite my uh, colleagues to come in on this as well. I think one of the most important things uh, for us to recognize is the state of technology today. Uh, the enormity of the change that we're experiencing uh, at this moment in terms of technological advances uh, and how we view these technologies in the context of their role in society for the betterment of humankind. <clears throat> Let me just say, I, I did another book not long ago on 
uh, policy development for artificial intelligence in the 21st century. And I see these technologies uh, as being central uh, to the improvement of the quality of life for all of us in the 21st century. And in the initial national security strategy guidance by the Biden administration, uh, and I really have to applaud their getting this out because it sometimes takes years for an administration to get out national security strategy. The Biden administration very specifically hones in on the role of the future of technology, which in many ways, uh, as thermonuclear forces defined much of the geopolitics of the 20th century, the emerging of technologies and the rate of change of technologies will define in many respects the geopolitics of the 21st century. And I have to credit the Biden administration for using two terms with respect to uh, technology. It says that we must come to grips with the reality of the peril and the promise of these technologies. And it was interesting, they sequenced the words as peril first and then promise second. Uh, and I think the reality that uh, the peril is, is several realities. One is these technologies are changing. These technologies offer massive, lethal, and disruptive capabilities to our opponents. The United States just had the colonial pipeline shut down by a non-state actor operating from the safe haven of Russia. And, and not only did it create, create massive inconvenience for millions of Americans, Shall I jump in on the Brexit uh, question there, Alexander, why John is frozen? I think he's uh, he has frozen. So, yeah, Julian, on the Brexit question. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, look, uh, most major big ticket collaborations are done uh, outside of an EU framework anyway. Um, so that is not directly affected by Brexit. If the European Defence Agency does indeed become the primary locus for big ticket prime contractors, uh, then Britain as a third country would be asked, like in Galileo, uh, to be um, investing in EU projects but having no say over EU projects. That won't stand. That will simply drive the British more towards collaboration with the United States. So we have to find a way around that. The key issue is why do we have, for example, two future combat air system projects in Europe? These are very complicated, sophisticated and expensive systems. To have Britain, Italy and Sweden on one hand and France, Germany on Spain on the other, putting forward competing tenders strikes me as complete madness. But let me conclude the comment on a much more important subject to do with this issue of technology and public-private partnerships. In January this year, and I'll quote, the European Defence Agency said, in 2019, defence research and technology R&T spending amounted to 1.7 billion euros, marking an increase of 13% compared to 2018. However, unlike total defence spending, which now surpasses 2011 uh, levels, investment in defence research and technology is much slower to recover and remains roughly 380 million euros below its 2007 high, end quote. If Europeans collectively cannot solve that problem, then the United States and its future force are going to sail over the horizon and nothing we Europeans can do with our legacy platforms, our aging and obsolete systems, will be able to work with the United States in a crisis or indeed face down the likes of the Russian and Chinese future force. Ergo, undermining deterrence fundamentally in the coming decade. That is the issue where Europeans have to address. How we invest together in the R&T so that that future tech force is in line with our American allies and others and is credible in the minds of our adversaries as a credible deterrent. Alexandra? Thank you, Julian. John, uh, you, were cyber, you were cyber attacked. <laughs> yeah, I think somebody didn't like what I said. Um, so again, this is a matter of us not so much uh, agreeing on the technologies itself, but agreeing as a group of people that share the same values on where we should take technology. Right now, we have a set of authoritarian values that seem to be uh, ultimately shaping how in China and Russia and in other illiberal states technology will move forward. We have a European approach, uh, which values the role of the individual in privacy, et cetera. And we have an American approach, and the dynamic is uh, the American approach, while privacy and human rights are very, very important, innovation, technological innovation uh, is extremely important to that approach. 
The Europeans are slightly different. Uh, I don't see that either are wrong, but they are not in sync. And the, the, some of the work that we're doing at Brookings is to have this conversation about how we move forward together with a common vision. It's really important uh, that we not have uh, a trifurcated view on innovation and technology and values going forward. It's really important, and this is not where the United States seeks to be a hegemon here. We seek to be a genuine partner uh, with our European partners and European friends. It's really important uh, that we come to some understanding and a meeting of the minds on how we do how we go about this uh, going forward. And I'll also come back to a point I made uh, a little while ago. I know we're on time here, uh, and that is while this book is about Europe, and while this book is is about getting ready for the Technolo technological conflict challenges of the future, which can drive us into hyperwar at some point. Uh, it's also about the creating the global approach to our values, the global approach to understanding how technology will shape geopolitics going into the 21st century or, or deeper into the 21st century, and how it can't just be about the transatlantic relationship. It's got to be bigger than that because the United States increasingly is being pulled to East Asia as is the power locus in the world, uh, shifting deeply into Asia. And we have to account for the geopolitics, the technology, our values, and our military strategy as we move forward. And thank you. That's um, a great way to conclude this, uh, this discussion. Uh, it's the end of this event, but not the end of the, of the conversation and the many uh, critical topics that you address in your, in your book. Uh, so thank you. I think this was really uh, a fascinating uh, conversation. Thank you, John. Thank you, Julian and Ben. And I do invite everyone to read your uh, your book so you have everything in the in the chat box. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a, a future opportunity to to continue to dive maybe even deeper into some of the um, hopefully tech technological issues because I thought this was really an interesting, very concrete part of your, of your book. So thank you all three. Uh, good evening to those who are based on that side of the Atlantic and good day to uh, those based in Washington and see you all very soon. Thank, thank you, Alexandra. Good, good night. night. Thanks to the Thanks audience. Thanks all. Thanks all. Uh -huh. <laughs>